Father, we just, just thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessings and your mercy upon our church and, and the blessing that's been to others who've been able to reach out through this medium here, this Zoom. I want to thank you for the members of our Sunday school class, Lord. They, they come together faithfully. Uh, we want to study your word. We want to draw near to you. So, Lord, I just ask that you would be with us. Those of these prayer requests that you heard, Lord, I just ask that you would be with those, those that you um, can heal. Lord, I just ask that you would heal them. Those that you can't, Lord, I just ask that you would give them comfort and strength. Lord, I just ask right now that you would be with uh, whoever's teaching to give them the insights that they need in order to take us further into this book. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I hope it's John. <laughs> as long as we're talking about Matthew and the Beatitudes, I'm ready to go. So. <laughs> oh, man, go. <laughs> Listen, I'm good with it. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna mute everybody. But if again, as always, if there are any questions, unmute yourself and just let fly, and we'll uh, we'll handle it. <laughs> Emma's reminding me to record. Sometimes I, I don't remember. All right, uh, let's go. Let's get started. Uh, so today we want to talk about Isaiah 37. It's a little bit different passage. There are no wo woe oracles here. There are no judgment oracles. This is narrative, and it's it's narrative in the middle of Isaiah. It comes at a, an important point. It's kind of the hinge. We'll go into that some more, but it's the division between uh, the first part of Isaiah, which is judgment and woes, and the second part of Isaiah, which is more comfort focused. And the two narrative passages are very similar because in the first passage, a king was facing a challenge and his decision was, was who was he going to trust? The second narrative passage, a king is facing a challenge and the decision is who is he going to trust? And it's a father-son kind of thing. Ahaz is the father of Hezekiah. So two kings, uh, two decisions on what they need to do and two different decisions on, on who they decide to trust. So I think the, the Isaiah has put this here is sort of a way to look backwards what has happened in Isaiah, but also a way to look forward. What is going to happen is if you trust God, this is what God can do. So it's, it's, I, I like to think of it as that hinge passage. The whole book kind of uh, bends and revolves around this passage. And today, I want to talk about, I want you to be thinking about prayer. Uh, it's wonderful that we start with prayer, but I, I want us to think about praying because we see some praying in this passage. And uh, it's, it's one of those passages you go, okay, boy, the king is going to be praying. This is going to be a good prayer. It's like in, in the Gospel of John, where Jesus prays for, for us, for believers today. And it's a wonderful prayer. And it's about a chapter long. And, you know, people can use it as a model or inspiration or whatever. Or the Lord's Prayer, which is an example of how we can pray if we want to. So, you know, on one level, we might be looking forward to say, okay, here's Hezekiah. He's making the right decision. Let's see how he prays. Maybe we can model after him. So we'll, we'll see how that works out. But I think the other thing to keep in mind is this is kind of a story of, of contrast here. It's, it's a word from two kings. So King Sennacherib, and I guess that's how you pronounce his name. I, I don't know, but that's how I'm going to pronounce it, has, has a word for, is, for uh, Jerusalem, has a word for Hezekiah. And uh, then God has a word from Hezekiah, the king of everything. And it's, uh, uh, it's interesting to see how these two are going to play out and whose word gets fulfilled and whose word uh, goes up as if in smoke. So that's, that's sort of another interesting contrast in here. But as we go through, think about how you pray to God and then what you do after you pray. So, do you, you, well, I'll, I'll get to that. I won't steal my own thunder. I'll, I'll make y'all wait to see what I think about that. So the context here, uh, we talked about the hinge passage, uh, a little bit about Hezekiah. I, the Bible loves good examples and bad examples. And I think Ahaz made the wrong decision back in Isaiah 7. Hezekiah is going to make the right decision here in Isaiah 37. But that doesn't mean that Hezekiah is necessarily a great guy for us to follow. Hezekiah is human, just like David is human. He, he in, a, in a crisis, he trusts God. But if things get better, it seems like he, he kind of loses track or he stops trusting God. Uh, he's gone through all this with God. And then we think, uh, I guess it's in chapter 39, 
the, the, the enemy, Assyria comes and he takes Assyria all through his storeroom and says, look at this rich portable stuff I have here. And look at this rich portable stuff I have here. And he's just, he's not necessarily always making good decisions, but, but in the crisis, he does know who to turn to and he, he turns to God. And I think maybe that's a little bit of encouragement for us because I, I don't know about y'all, but I, that's the way I am. If it's a crisis, I know who to turn to, but I don't necessarily live my life on a daily basis with that in mind. And I think that's something for all of us to learn and concentrate on more. So if we kind of summarize what's going on, Isaiah 34 and 35 sum up at the end of the first half. 34 is the Lord will avenge himself against all enemies. So everybody. But 35 is that the redeemed will see God's salvation. So it's kind of putting a period to that, that judgment and woe in the beginning of Isaiah. And now we're going to move on to comfort where we, we see the, the suffering servant. We see all the messianic passages. We see all those passages that Paul loves to quote in the New Testament. So it's very much, this is what's going to happen after the bad times. And I think it's important to, to keep that in mind then and today because everyone's going through bad times. I mean, there's the coronavirus, but I, I just, I am convinced there is pain in everybody's life. We're all dealing with something that's troubling. And we have to remember that God has promised us. And just like his promises to Hezekiah came true, his promises to, promises to us will also come true. Now, that doesn't mean we hurt any less, but hopefully it means we're able to keep things in perspective and we know there is an end and we know there is something better coming on. Politics here are very confusing. I, I, we could spend an hour talking about all the, the, the backstabbing and alliance shifting and who did what to whom and all that stuff, but I, I wanna kinda summarize it to it's, it's, it's easier for us to understand. And one of the big players is Sennacherib. He's the king of Assyria, and he's the new king of Assyria. Now, when a new king is crowned, it's a time of change. Remember back in Isaiah 6, everybody's worried. Well, Sennacherib is a new king, and one of the things a new king can do to kind of cement his rule and gain popularity is go on a military battle, conquer his enemies. And that is what Sennacherib has been doing, and he's been being, yeah, he has been being very successful. And in that culture, it wasn't just that the king was successful or the army was successful. It was the God of that people was successful because there was no separation between church and state. The church and state was the same. So it wasn't Assyria that won a battle. It was the God of the Assyrians that won the battle. And Sennacherib now is going around and he's going to be bragging to Israel. He's trash talking God. I, you know, I could make fun of it. I can joke about it. But he's saying, your God is powerless. Your God can't stop anybody. If your God were so powerful, why do I have Jerusalem surrounded and why am I getting ready to kill you all? So Sennacherib is not only trying to physically conquer Jerusalem, he is saying, my God is getting ready to conquer your God. Now that's always a dangerous position to take. If you think back to David and Goliath, God will protect his honor. So that's, that's one of the characters here. Um, the other thing that's going on is Hezekiah, the king of the southern kingdom, Judah, when a new king comes into being, it's a time for the vassal kings to try a little bit of rebellion. Maybe the new king's not going to be as strong. Maybe they can get better uh, terms and conditions. So Hezekiah starts a revolt. And this is something that he had planned for a long time. He even went so far as to secure his water supply. Now, Jerusalem at this time was a relatively small town, had a wall, nice wall all the way around it. And it was up on the top of a hill, very, very hard to attack or conquer conquer. Uh, you could lay siege to Jerusalem and then wait for the people to run out of food and water, but that could take a long time. One of the things Hezekiah did was he built a tunnel from inside the walls of Jerusalem out underneath the walls to the nearest spring. And then he covered up the spring so it wasn't uh, visible from the surface. So in case of uh, attack, if the town was surrounded and under siege, they could go through this tunnel and still have a secure water supply for all the people in Jerusalem. And for a long time, people thought that that was uh, an indication of how the Bible had to be wrong because it would be impossible to dig a tunnel that long. It would be impossible you know, to, to have it going in the right direction and, and all those things. It was just impossible. So clearly the Bible was wrong. And that was a relatively decent argument because it, it is an engineering feat. It is hard to navigate and make sure that tunnel goes in the right direction. It was a relatively decent comment again about the inaccuracy of the Bible right up until the point where they found Hezekiah's tunnel. 
and you can actually walk through it today. The water level depends on rain and stuff like that. Uh, the last time we were there in Israel, the water temperature, I think, was 47 degrees, and it was mid-thigh. So we did not walk through Hezekiah's tongue, but you can if you want to. Mm -hmm. But I, I just, I, I think it's interesting that, again, something in the Bible that people thought didn't exist, couldn't exist, we found through archaeology that it really does exist. And it gives me confidence those other things in the Bible that we haven't necessarily confirmed through archaeology yet. We, we may very well find it in the next archaeological dig. So Hezekiah is getting ready to rebel. He rebels and Sennacherib comes to put him in his place. And now Sennacherib has conquered a lot of Judah and he has Jerusalem surrounded. He builds walls all around Jerusalem so no one can escape. And he is he's getting ready to attack, but he knows an attack will be costly in terms of men and equipment because Jerusalem really is pretty well defended geographically with the hills and the walls. So he's trying to scare the people. And in 36, he, he has the people addressed directly to say, your God's no good. Your God can't protect you. Now in passage here in 37, he's going to be addressing Hezekiah directly. And Hezekiah is going to have to make the same sort of choice his, his father had to make. And we'll see what kind of, uh, what kind of choice Hezekiah makes. Now, uh, biblically, there's, uh, there's some parallels here too. If we go back to Isaiah 7, when Ahaz goes out to meet the Assyrians to, to negotiate with them, uh, he meets them at a certain place by the spring. This is exactly where Hezekiah goes out to. So it's, it's a repeat of the pattern, like father, like son, I guess, in this case, although the decisions are different. But it's just it's interesting that this, this happens in the same sort of environment. Uh, so <clears throat> the, the people are threatened in 36, and God gives them a message of encouragement. Now, uh, Sennacherib has sent, has sent messages directly to Hezekiah to kind of see if he can scare Hezekiah, if he can intimidate Hezekiah, just like the Assyrians were able to intimidate Hezekiah's father, Ahaz. So that's that's where our passage picks up, and I, I want to read it relatively quickly here. So this is uh, Isaiah 37, and I'm going to start off with 14 through 20. Isaiah 37, 14 through 20. Then Hezekiah took the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And he went up to the house of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. Hezekiah prayed to the Lord saying, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim, you are God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And listen to all the words of Sennacherib, who sent them to reproach the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have devastated all the countries and the lands and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. So have they, they have destroyed them. Now, O Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand and all the kingdoms of, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. Let's go over to chapter, uh, verse 30. Then this shall be the sign for you. You will eat this year what grows of itself, and the second year what springs from the same, and in the third year sow, reap, plant vineyards, and eat their fruit. The surviving remnant of the house of Judah will again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem will go forth a remnant, and out of Mount Zion survivors. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he will not come to this city or shoot an arrow there. He will not come before it with a shield or throw up a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, by the same way he will return, and he will not come to this city, declares the Lord. And that settles it, I guess. So that's our passage today. We need to go back and just look a little bit at, at verses 10 through 13. I'm not going to read them all, but it really is just uh, Sennacherib trash-talking God. He's trying to get Hezekiah to doubt God. Sennacherib is saying, if your God were so powerful, how come he didn't stop us when we conquered these people and we conquered these people? And when we got you surrounded, where's your God now? I, I, I'm reminded of Charlton Heston in uh, in, in Moses, the Ten Commandments, and maybe one of the worst uh, casting calls is the, the Edward G. Robinson is the slave leader. And he, he goes, yeah, yeah, Moses, where's your God now, Moses? Within his kind of gangster accent. But, but the point is the same. You're insulting God. You're saying God is not there for you. Your only hope is to worship me and worship my God because your God is powerless. Now, that's, again, a dangerous thing to do. So, 
the messengers from Sennacherib come, they give this letter to Hezekiah. Hezekiah reads the letter and the messengers are waiting around for Hezekiah to crumble, just like his father crumbled. Hezekiah does something different. We look at uh, verse 14. Hezekiah took the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the house of the Lord. He doesn't respond to the messengers. He doesn't say anything to him. He just he sits there and he reads the letter and then he leaves. Uh, kind of a gutsy sort of thing because he uh, he's, he's insulting them. They don't know what to go back and, and tell Sennacherib or Sennacherib's agent. Yeah, I, I can just see him going back and they say, well, we gave it to the king. And, uh, and what did he do? Well, uh, he didn't do anything. He walked out. Uh, okay. You don't know where to go. You don't know what's going to happen. It's sort of a little bit of a attention uh, kind of thing. But look what he does. He takes the letter. He reads it. Then he went up to the house of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. Now, at the beginning of chapter 37, there's another message, and, and Hezekiah asked Isaiah to pray for him and see if the Lord has anything to say. But this time, Hezekiah is going straight to God. Okay, he's taking it, and I, and I just, I love this image. He's taking the letters, and he spreads it out before God. He says, God, here it is. I mean, if you think about that, that's a very personal kind of relationship. He is, he's in the temple. He goes to the house of the Lord. The presence of the Lord, I think we need to remember that. The, the temple is where God lives. I mean, you know, it, I've said this before in the class. If you look at a, a wall and you imagine God living on the other side of that wall, that's Hezekiah's relationship with God. He is taking this to God and saying, God, here is the problem. He spreads it out before the Lord. And I think it's interesting that the focus is more on God than on himself. He is, he's worried about God's honor first. He's worried about God keeping his promises first. And, he, and well, let, let's look and, and see what goes on here. Verse 16. Um, o Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim, you are God, you alone. Of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. He's not really asking for anything yet, is he? He is telling God who he is. Now, first time I read that uh, in preparing for today, I said, well, that's kind of strange because God already knows who he is. God knows that he's the creator. There is no doubt in God's mind that he's the creator. But then as I thought more, I thought about it and I said, you know what? This is not for God. This is for Hezekiah. Hezekiah needs to remind himself to whom he is praying. God is being challenged by these all these Assyrian gods, and Hezekiah needs to remember that God is the God who created everything, that he's not a little nation God that, that doesn't exist, that's a, a man-made idol or something like that. This is the living God, the God of creation, the God that created everything. And if he gets that right in his mind, that gives him, I think, the right mindset to continue the prayer because I, I'm going to make this argument today that it's not how well we pray. It's not how nicely we pray. It's not how detailed we pray. It's not how eloquently we pray. It's the character of him to whom we pray. I think I got those words right. It's the character of God that's important. It doesn't matter so much exactly how we pray if we understand God is the God, the creator, the God of Israel. And I think that's important here. So go back and, and, and look here uh, in, in verse 15. It says, praise to the Lord. That's the Yahweh name. That's the covenant God. And in a way, um, Hezekiah is, I, I don't want to say he's confronting God, but he's reminding God of the covenant. He's saying, Yahweh, you made these promises to Abraham. You made these promises to Moses. I am faithful to you. I believe in you. Your honor is at stake here. You are being insulted. And I, I'm making a covenant call here, Lord. You promised these things, and I'm looking for you to fulfill those promises. So your honor, it's not just my life that it's at stake, Lord. It's your honor. If you let these Assyrians destroy you, everyone's going to think that you've broken your promises to protect the, the house of David, to protect Jerusalem. So I, I just, I really want you to understand exactly the terrible things the Assyrians are saying about you. So you will be really convinced that, that you need to do something about it. And we see exactly the same thing in, in Psalm 22 is David is reminding God, he, Lord, I've been faithful since birth. And he goes on and explains that. And he says, now here's all the terrible things people are doing to me. Come closer, Lord, because if you come closer, you will see what they're doing and you will honor your covenant and you will rescue me. And I'm going to start praising you right now because I know you will do it. All right. So I, I think that some of this is, is what's going on here. So, uh, 
Hezekiah prays to the Lord, and now we're going to get our example of how to pray to the Lord. Okay, here's a godly king going to pray to the Lord. And he starts off, all right, he starts off buttering up God. Not really. He starts off understanding who God is. Uh, God is the Lord. Okay, and again, that's that Yahweh thing. Uh, and and he's the one that, that is the covenant God, the one that is going to fulfill all his promises. Um. And then if we look at the titles, uh, let's see, uh, I guess titles, I'll go back and look at 16. O Lord of hosts. Again, the first part, O Lord, is that Yahweh, the covenant kind of Lord. But it's the Lord of hosts. It's the idea of the, the general of the heaven's armies. So this is kind of a military thing. So it, once he gets off, okay, Yahweh, it's the Yahweh who's in charge of armies. And, and we kind of need an army now because we're surrounded by guys that want to kill us, literally want to kill us. The God of Israel. Okay, again, as opposed to the God of something, Assyria or something. This is our God, my God, the God that Moses had the relationship with. Abraham had the relationship. I have the relationship, the God that's on the other side of the wall in the Holy of Holies. Lord, I am calling you now. Listen to me. See my problem. Pay attention to me because it's not just me that is under threat here. It's you, and I want you to know exactly what's going on. The, the, the Holy of Holies in the temple is where the ark was, and the, the, the cherubim are these kind of winged figures on either side of the top of the ark where the, the priest would, would make a sacrifice on the day, the day of atonement. And then the presence of the Lord would appear between the cherubim. So I, I think this is a little bit of a poetic way to, to just literally indicate the presence of the Lord. God is just behind that wall, and I'm talking to him, and he can hear me. So again, this is very, very personal. This is uh, me pouring my heart out to the Lord, reminding myself of who he is, and then just, just telling him what the problem is. So I, I think, again, as we're thinking about prayer, there might be a model for our prayer here. So he, he gets his attention. He, he establishes in his own mind who this God is. He's the living God, the God of Israel, the God, the alone God, the one who made everything. So he's, okay, I got it. You're in power. I don't understand what's happening with the Assyrians, but but you can handle it because you're the ones that made the Assyrians, and you can unmake them with, with you know just as easily. So verse 17, he, he starts a, sort of the petition or the problem. He says, incline your ear, O Lord. And he's actually using imperatives or commands in, uh, in the Hebrew. So he is, he's asking God, God, pay attention, please, right? Hear me, open your eyes and see, because you know, I'm spreading this stuff out before you, Lord. I want you to see. I want you to know exactly what's going on. And now that I have your attention, listen to what Sennacherib is saying. He's bad-mouthing you, Lord. Well, I'm sorry, that's not what the Bible says. He sent to them to reproach the living God. It says, truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have devastated all the countries and their lands, and they have cast their gods in the fire, for they are not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. So they, they have destroyed them. So he's establishing in his mind to whom he is praying, and, and he tells God, here's the problem. They're insulting you. They're blaspheming you. They're saying all these terrible things about you. Okay, he hadn't asked for anything yet. He's just making sure that God understands exactly what's going on. Now let's uh, look at verse 20. Now, O Lord, our God, again, all that personal covenant stuff, deliver us from his hand and all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. And that's the end of the passage. That's his prayer to God. Now, O Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand and all the kingdom that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. Deliver us, not because I want to be delivered, but deliver us so all the kingdoms of the world will know that you are God, so that your honor will be protected, because your honor is more important than what I want. Because if your honor is sustained, then I will get what's best for me, because you promised me that. If your honor is sustained, you will keep your promises, and I don't have to worry about what I'm going to get from you. You have promised me that it would be for my good. Now, where are all the eloquent details? Oh, God, I, we don't see it. Where is the detailed description of exactly what Hezekiah wants God to do to all the enemies? Well, Lord, would you smite that bunch over there, and then once you get done with that, smite this bunch here and, and do, and just, and all the details Hezekiah doesn't do it. He says, deliver us because of your honor. 
because he knows if God's honor is sustained, he will be delivered even better than he can imagine. Okay. Now, sometimes I, I don't think there's anything the matter with long, detailed prayers. Please don't get me wrong. But sometimes I think we might include all those details because we're trying to micromanage God. We're, we're not quite, we, we've told God what we want, but we're not quite sure that he can get it done the way we want to get it done. And we give him these details just so there's no wiggle room. If I get all the details right, God's going to have to do what I tell him to do. And I don't think that's the way prayer works. I just so often when I am praying and I'm, I'm just kind of pouring my heart out to God and I'm thinking about all the details of a specific health situation or, or something like that, my uncle that I've been praying for a lot. Um, I just, I am not a spiritual giant, y'all, but I'm just, I'm kind of telling you what I feel. I, I'm praying to God and I'm, I, I kind of get the feeling that God is up there, you know, with his little notebook and he's, and I'm saying, Lord, would you please uh, help my uncle's wife be patient? He's going, yep, that's on my list. And I say, would you please do this? And he go, yep, that's on my list. And would you please? And I go through like 25 things and he go, check, 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 check. Anything else, John? And I go, well, you know, man, I pretty much you know, used all my imagination to think of all the details. I can. And he goes, great, fine. I love that you're with praying with me. I love that you're doing that. And you know what? I heard all those things. I checked them off. And I've got 10 or 12 things that you haven't even thought about yet that I'm going to do for your uncle that are going to be better than anything you mentioned. And I, so I, again, please don't get me wrong. I think that level of detail and concern is important. And it might be important for us. It might be important for me to go through thinking about all those things my uncle or the situation needs so that if there's something I can do to help him, then God can use my details. Go, you know, John, you, you could take care of that for him, or you could cause that to happen, or you could do this. So I think any communication with God is good, but I want us to be careful that sometimes all we need to do is say, Lord, deliver us for the sake of your honor. And God goes, okay, I got it. We don't have to tell him all those details. We just have to understand who he is and that he loves us, and he is honorable, and he's made promises to us, and he will fulfill those promises. We don't have to think of every good thing to ask for him, because regardless of how many good things we have to ask for, he has even more good things to give us. So I just, I, I, I guess it's kind of a balanced thing. It's not that a short prayer is bad or good, not that a long prayer is bad or good, but sometimes I think we, we get concerned that if we don't pray correctly or pray long enough, that it's not an effective prayer. And remember, it's not how good we pray, it's to whom we pray. So we, we, we kind of, we have this situation here, the words of Sennacherib, and uh, then we're going to hear the words of God, and God is going to say, I'm going to deliver you. Okay. And, and that, again, kind of settles it. If you go to verse uh, 35, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of David's and my servant David's sake. That's all you really need to hear. Okay. Lord, deliver us. The Lord goes, I got you delivered. Okay. Now, all the details are important, but I don't know if those are always absolutely necessary. So, God, here's the problem. Would you deliver it? Not be, deliver us, not because we deserve it, but because to protect your honor. So you've made a promise. We want to see you keep that promise. So then we get the sign. So God said, I'm going to deliver you. Now here's a sign. Uh, Ahaz got a sign, Emmanuel, the virgin birth, and Hezekiah is going to get a sign, but it's kind of a weird sign. So uh, if, if we look at verse 30, this shall be a sign for you. This is God's response to Hezekiah, and it's what Hezekiah is going to go tell all the people, I guess. This is what God told me in response to Sennacherib. You will eat this year what grows of itself, and the second year what springs from the same, and the third year sow, reap, plant vineyards, and eat their fruit. It's a little bit confusing even on a basic level, but I think what's going on here. It's the first year is the invasion year. The, their armies have been coming through. They're destroying crops. They're stealing everything they get, and there will be no organized farming. All you will have is what was kind of fell by the wayside, the gleanings and stuff like that. But God says that's going to be enough for the first year. Second year, same situation. Now, and again, don't exactly not sure why they couldn't plan in the second year, but still maybe they're <clears throat> rebuilding. I don't know. But in the second year, there still will be no organized planning, but there will be gleanings to feed everybody. Then in the third year, 
redemption is going to happen, restoration is going to happen. Things are going to be so good that you're going to be able to harvest the grapes that I guess you started planting in the first year. But grapes or, or wine are a symbol of peace and prosperity in the Bible. You only get that when there is peace and prosperity. So, so God is saying, okay, three years from now, everything is going to be great. That's, that's my paraphrase. I think I'm interpreting that correctly. Now, again, when I'm going through reading that, I go, well, thank you, Jesus. But, you know, what does that help me with today? I know that in three years, things are going to get better. But I'm still surrounded by all these armies. But I trust you, Lord. You told me you will deliver the city of David. Uh, you will del deliver the city of David. And I know that within three years, our agricultural system will, we, will be back and we'll be making wine and we'll be prosperous and we will be peaceful. And thank you for doing all of that. Okay. So I, I guess Hezekiah takes that to the people and uh, they hear the word of the Lord. They compare it to Sennacherib and say, we're going to trust the Lord. And everybody went to sleep for a good night's sleep because God said he was going to deliver. And he's given us this nebulous sign that three years from now, we'll know uh, exactly what's coming on. So we prayed for delivery. God said, we get it. Here's how you're going to know that I get it. Wait three years and you'll see the, the wine crop come back. Okay. Well, that's not the end of the story. Let's look at verse 36. Okay. This is after all the praying, after all the signs, after everything, Hezekiah has told everybody, and everybody's going to sleep. Then the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when men rose early in the morning, behold, all of these were dead. Verse 37, I, just, I love verse 37. Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home and lived at Nineveh. No kidding. <laughs> I, I mean, I, that's just got, I don't, it's, that's got to be dry humor or something. He's had almost 200,000 men killed. They wake up and they find 185,000 dead men. I'd get out of there too. My army's gone. There's nothing I can do. And I wouldn't want to stay around that many dead people. So it struck me that God said, okay, I'll give you a sign. But what he's really saying is, trust me. Okay. You won't really know this sign for three years, but trust me. Now go to sleep, have a good night's sleep because you trust me. And when they trusted God, God gave them a sign that they didn't have to wait three years for. All they had to wait for was the morning. Okay. Hezekiah risked everything and threw it in the lap of the Lord and said, Lord, I'm spreading it out before you. I trust you. I am committing myself, my city, my everything to you. Deliver us. And what did God do? He delivered them. And I, I just, I, I wonder, and, and this is for me as, as much as for anybody, but, but we're all surrounded by enemies of some kind on a day-to-day -day basis. And if we just took it to the Lord and, and spread it out before the Lord and said, Lord, here it is. Okay. And I don't know what needs to be done. And I don't know all the details, but would you handle it, please? Would you deliver me? And then if I had the faith to live my life based on the understanding that I would be delivered, what my life would look like, what kind of miracles or signs or things God is waiting to do for me if I would just ask him and totally commit myself. Okay. And again, I don't know that this is the example for all prayer, but I wonder if it's not an example for a lot of good prayer. And it's as much about committing everything we have to the Lord and saying, Lord, here it is, whatever. I'm trusting you to do the right thing. I'm trusting your honor. I'm trusting you to fulfill your promise. I just wonder what our lives would look like if that was different. Okay, so what? Who do we trust when we're surrounded by life-threatening forces? Clearly God. Isaiah is giving us an example here, a positive example that will set up the second half of Isaiah, the comfort, the Messiah, the suffering servant that, that solves the problem of the sins of the people. How do we pray about it? I, I think long detailed prayers are great, but sometimes I just, I, I think it's, Lord, you, you already know all this stuff. You already know what's going to happen. I'm going to trust you to do the best thing, and I'm going to be on the lookout for what you've done, and I'm going to lead my, lead my life on the basis of that. Okay. So I think the question for us all as we go through today and, and next week is, will we pray? How will we pray? 
And then what will we do once we pray? Let's pray now. Lord, thank you so much for being an honorable God, for being a God who keeps your promise, for being a God who loves us and has promised the best for us. Lord, thank you for having so much patience when we pray to you and try to tell you what to do. And Lord, thank you for having enough wisdom and power to know when that is the right thing to do. And sometimes when we ask that it's the wrong thing to do. Lord, I pray that we would depend on you. We would give you everything and depend on your grace, your mercy to deliver us and provide for us in ways that we can't even understand. That we would pray to receive your gifts, but we would also be on the lookout for gifts from you that are greater than anything we can even imagine. Lord, we thank you for the times that you've saved us in the past that we know about and even more for the times you've saved us when we don't know about it. We pray that you would continue to do that as we go forward. Lord, help us be your light in the world. Help us be a difference in the world when people are facing the enemies of the world and help us depend totally on you and your deliverance when we have to face those enemies. Lord, we raise up all these prayers in the name of your son and just ask that you bring us all back together again healthy next week. In his name we pray, amen.